All right, so in chapter 11, there are two segments, and the second segment of chapter 11 talks about communion, which seems like it's a slam dunk topic to go after. The first part of the chapter actually talks about something that sounds like sexism and gender inequality. And that would be the topic that, if you were in my position, you would prefer to avoid today. But I've decided to tackle that topic. And when I read this passage of Scripture, some of you are going to come close to having a seizure. So just hang on. It, it, it might mean something different than you think. Because here's the challenge. We interpret this passage not based on the culture it was written in, but based on our culture. And when we do that, we hear the wrong thing. So let's just take a look at this. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is... See, already some of you started, your eyes are going up in your head. It's, it's happening. And, and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of God. So you won't even say it. <laughs> I mean, this is such risky waters to wade into. And here's the thing. If we are going to only accept a Bible that agrees with us, there's a problem. And if we're only going to read the parts that we think we understand, it's a problem. And that's why we're going after topics like this today. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. It seems like Paul's got a vendetta here. Neither was man created for woman, but woman was created for the man. For it is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is, not, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. Now, that's surprising. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, is it a disgrace to him? Boy, did I hear this passage preached back in the 70s. <laughs> but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Well, here we go. First thing I want you to see, three things to remember that the church needs to remember when it comes to addressing issues of our culture. And the first, we cannot ignore the culture around us. That the church cannot pretend like culture doesn't matter or we don't live in a culture, because we do. This passage is often not taken seriously because people think that it's just addressing hairstyles and head coverings. And uh, it's often used, by the way, on both uh, progressive and conservative or more traditional sides to try to impose behavior or freedom on individuals. And what I want you to notice, you probably didn't notice because we have a very hard time listening to passages like this without kind of going a little squirrely. But every time Paul says something about women, he also says something about men. But because of our cultural bias, we don't hear it. And, and I'm going to kind of unpack that as we go along today. And he actually starts with men, believe it or not. You might not know who this is. It's a statue of a guy by the name of Augustus who was a political leader in the uh, arena of politics in Corinth at that time. In fact, he was a famous Roman leader. And 
if you'll notice, he's actually wearing a toga with it pulled over his head. This was highly uncommon for statues to look like this. And the only reason that he did this is because he was on a marketing campaign to tell everybody not only was he a great political leader, but he was also a spiritual leader. And when you would go into the pagan temples, whoever the spiritual elite priest was that would be performing the rites for the day, when they would engage in that activity, they would take their toga and they would pull it up over their head. And the message was this. I'm the most spiritually elite person in the room, and only I can do this. And nobody else was allowed to pull their togas over their head. You had to leave your togas where they were. So he actually starts with the men. So he had these statues placed all over the countryside so that people would see how prominent he was, not only as a political leader, but as a spiritual leader. Now, uh, what, he, what Paul is saying is, is that men are going into the church, and when they go to do something like prophesy or pray or something like that, they've been so impressed by the, how people show their elitism and prominence in the culture around them that they pull the toga up over their head. And what they're saying is, I'm the most spiritually important person in this room, and nobody can do this but me. And Paul says, yeah, you can't do that. The other thing is, is that in pagan worship, it was a pluralism of gods. So when you covered your head, you were acknowledging that you served lots of gods. And what Paul is saying for men, when you cover your head, you are not acknowledging the exclusive relationship you have with the true and the living God. Don't cover your head. You look like you're just another pagan priest. So that's kind of what's going on behind that. So Paul kind of says, you're taking a page right out of pagan worship. You, you can't do that. Then... In the ancient world, we're going to go on the female side of this now, in the ancient world, by the time you turned 14, that's when your parents would start marrying you off. Most women were married shortly after they turned 14 years old. So if you are a parent who has a 14-year-old, just think about that. And if you are in the room and you are a 14-year-old, think about that. I mean, this is terrifying at every angle. So, and here's the thing. In the ancient wedding celebrations... The, the, the veil for the bride was just as prominent a part of her bridal garb as it is today. So how many see what? Oh, it's not very easily seen here, but there's a, there's a woman, and she's a bride, and she's got a veil. And I'm, I'm from the era that they actually used to wear the veils over their faces when they came in because they, they didn't want, I guess, the guy to see who it really was until... <laughs> he was in too deep or something, and now they just kind of wear these things behind them. But so it, the, the, the veil was really prominent, and it, the, what was different is that in, in the old school way of doing it, just, just before the, the, the groom is going to kiss the bride, they take the veil back and then, then he kisses. And then after the ceremony, the, bride, the veil comes off. It's, that's done. In the ancient world, the veil was put on at the wedding. And you wore a semblance of it for the rest of your married life. It was the equivalent of a wedding band. Like, you can tell by a quick glance at someone's left hand whether they are involved in an exclusive relationship or not. And in the ancient world, the way you could tell that with a woman is she had a head covering. And by the way, it wasn't a full veil over her face. The face was not covered. It was just something that she wore over her head. So wouldn't you think it a little bit strange if... When people were coming into worship today, they were taking their wedding bands off and putting them in a, a box or a just, and you would say, why are, why are they doing that? What is the purpose behind it? The other thing you need to know is that Corinth was a very hypersexualized society. We think ours is bad, and that's because uh, we certainly have pushed a number of boundaries, but I will tell you that Corinth had us beat in every capacity at every turn. Uh, there are things that I could tell you about that culture that would embarrass 21st century Americans in the Northeast. I mean, it's just unbelievable what went on. And so what you probably don't realize is that if a woman did not have a head covering on, what she was saying was is that she was in fact available and there was another thing that occurred. If you were a wealthy person and you had people over to your house for dinner, among the things that you would arrange for is not just the appetites for food, but appetites for sex. And you would arrange for women to be there to serve the physical pleasure appetites of the men who came to the meal 
And the way you could identify which women were available for that purpose is they would have their head uncovered because these were not married women. And so Paul says, when women uncover their head, what they're doing is they are dishonoring their exclusive relationship. They're communicating to everybody that, in fact, they are not married when they are and that they might be available for something that is nothing more than the physical appetite of male men who are in the room. By male men, that was a redundant statement. I wasn't referring to the postal community, so... <laughs> Just... Got to be really careful what you say. <laughs> now, there was one other occasion in which women would take their head coverings off, and that is if a wealthy woman was in a room, uh, in her home, uh, and with a few friends who were also wealthy, they would take their veils off just because it was a private and there were no men around and, and like that. But if another woman came in and she did not equal their status of wealth, she was not permitted to take her, hel her head covering off, her veil off, because they... Uh, Corinth was very finance conscious, and so they always want to know who has the money, who doesn't have the money. And so if you were invited to a dinner, but you were not very uh, wealthy and there was only women present, you still had to keep your head covering on. So Paul says, this is sending some really unfortunate messages. You are confusing people about your exclusive relationships and you are actually communicating that you're available for things that you shouldn't be communicating you're available for. And it creates confusion and it creates division. And he actually talks about this. It would be better, you, just, you might as well just cut your hair off. What you don't realize, maybe, is that in that day, when a woman was caught in an adulterous relationship, that was the way they humiliated her. They would shave her head off so that everybody who saw her would know that she had violated her marriage vows. By the way, they didn't hold the same standards for men. I know you're stunned by that. It's never been like that in any other culture at any other time. But what I will tell you is that men on their way home from work were as likely to stop by a brothel and have their physical needs met as men are today to stop by a bar and get a beer or just pick up a cup of coffee on the way home. That's how hypersexualized the culture was. And so Paul says, when we confuse these things, we live in a culture where those things mean things, and you can't ignore what they mean in the culture. When a guy covers his head, he's saying that he has no exclusive relationship and he thinks he's the most important person in the room. And a woman uncovers her head, he, she's saying she has no exclusive relationship and she's available for anyone in the room. And Paul says you can't ignore what the culture thinks about this. You have to pay attention. Right? Now that brings us to the second point. And the second point is that we are called to challenge the culture around us. So the church is called to be aware. We can't ignore the culture around us, but we are called to challenge the culture around us. And you probably missed it when I read by it because our eyes kind of start rolling up in our head when we start hearing things like, you know, women were created for men and that the, the glory of woman is man. And, and we hear all these things and, and we just tune out. There's something, I guarantee you didn't catch it when I read it, and yet it's one of the most significant and important things. It was stunning. It was scandalous in the culture when Paul wrote it. And he said, when a woman prophesies and prays and uncovers her head. And we just roll right by that. This is the first time in anything approaching Judaism or Christianity where we hear about women in a public mixed gathering who are prophesying and praying. In Judaism, women were not considered full members of the religious community, and they actually had to participate in worship mostly by sitting behind an entire veiled session. They weren't even allowed to see what was happening, much less actually participate in it. And Paul is indicating that in the Christian church that women can both pray and prophesy. He's just saying when you do it, don't dishonor the exclusive relationships that you have in your life and don't indicate something sexual while you're doing it. Now, it is surprising that even today there's a lot of controversy among church circles about what roles women are allowed to play. And there are people that will say, well, this, he's just talking about when the women get together by themselves. That's not true. They were allowed to take their head coverings off when they're by themselves. The reason he's talking about this is because there are men present. Now, if you are, come from a, a Pentecostal or charismatic stream of Christianity, then you believe that prophecy has to do with the foretelling of something God wants to accomplish in your life, and he wants you to prepare your heart and your life to be able to receive it. 
But if you come from a non-Pentecostal, non-charismatic stream, you will have to interpret prophecy as actually the public teaching of God's Word, which many people do. So just think about how stunning this statement is. Paul is saying when women are publicly teaching or foretelling the things that God wants to do, just make sure your head covering is on so they realize that you do have an exclusive relationship with your husband and you're not there just to please somebody else. I can't tell you how scandalizing that was to the culture. This kind of freedom was unheard of. Nobody had been exposed to anything like this. He says, nevertheless, in the Lord, this is what he says now, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman, for as woman came, uh, as woman came from man, so man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. He starts talking about the concept of interdependence that we actually need each other in the body of Christ. And he's saying there is a created order. Adam was created first, but that doesn't mean that Eve is a lesser creature. In fact, she's intended to be an equal with Adam, but there is an order in creation. Is this making sense to anyone? No? Okay, I'll try to explain it. So, um, one of the most terrifying things you could ever ask me to do, I mean, it will make my blood freeze on the spot, and I'll go into something very close to a catatonic state, and, 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 and I will be paralyzed, gripped with fear. And that is if you ask me to dance. <laughs> now, you might not appreciate this, but I was raised in a culture where dancing was considered unacceptable. In fact, the joke was that our church was against premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. So that's, <laughs> that's how bad that was. And so the whole concept about just that just, I, I, it's not me. It's not. Now, I will tell you that it has happened on a couple of occasions. And there is a video. Look at your heads pop up. Shame on you. <laughs> I have sworn that person to never release that video, but here's the thing. There is another kind of dancing where you're not just kind of out there on your own, and it's dancing as a couple. And so one year for our anniversary, I decided that I, as an anniversary gift to my wife, would get us dance lessons. Dance lessons as a couple. Now, the way most couples dance today is they just kind of lean on each other and rock a little bit to the music, which I wanted to do something a little bit more than that. And so we learned the waltz, we learned the rumba, we learned the foxtrot, we learned swing, we learned the polka. Did we learn anything else? I don't remember most of it now, but, you know, we, we learned this. And, and here's, there was this little lady that was teaching us. She was this tall, and she was skinny as a toothpick, and that woman could lead a Mack truck around a dance floor. She was something else, had been a professional dancer in her life. It really was very impressive. And she would tell me, it's your responsibility to lead. And I said, why? And she says, because if you don't pay, she said, you have to pay attention. She said, if you're not paying attention, you're going to run your wife into another couple, or you're going to run her into a pole, or you're going to run her into the wall. You have to pay attention, and you have to steer her away from all those obstacles that are in the room. I don't know if that makes sense. Right? So now, in addition to keeping rhythm to music and remembering the steps, I've got to watch out for objects that we could run into. And this is incredibly complicated, and I'm not built for this. You know, it's just... There's a reason why I do this for a living, because dancing is not required, you know. So, but, but we learned this, and, and here's the thing. Are we going to make the argument, are you really going to make the argument that because someone is responsible to ensure that the other person doesn't get hurt, that the other person is less? You both can't lead, but that doesn't mean that you're not both equal. And... We impose these kinds of foolish concepts. And God has built some things into the system so that we don't get hurt. Someone takes the initiative. He's not saying you're better. He's just saying it's your job. This is things we have to think about. And Paul, when, when he talks about that, that concept about, you know, it is true that, that woman came out of man. Adam was created first, and, and we know that, that, that God took a rib out of Adam and created woman. It is also true that every man since then has been born from a woman. And it is true that everything comes from God. It is also true in Genesis when God said that we were created in his image and likeness. He wasn't just referring to the males. He said male and female. 
So how do we get this idea that somehow women are less? And that has more to do with the culture around us that needs to be challenged than with the scripture in front of us that actually gives us some options. Look what it says in Galatians. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Look at this. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. He says there's no ethnic difference. One ethnicity does not have a, 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 a leg up on any other group just because of their ethnicity. Neither slave nor free. There's no economic division that keeps you from the grace of God. And then he goes on, nor is there male or female. Your gender does not determine your ability to approach God, for you are all one in Christ. That's what he calls us to. And that's not how our culture thinks about it. And if you, if you don't understand this, you won't understand verse 3, where he says, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. If, if we interpret that if you're not the head, somehow you're demeaned, then what does this say about God and Jesus? Are we going to make the argument that God the Father was demeaning Jesus because Jesus took on the role of, as son? You see, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Scripture teaches us that they are equal, but they all have different functions and different roles so that they can release redemption in our lives and communicate the love of God to our lives. The Son did not have to submit to the Father for any reason other than he was part of the plan of redemption. He was not less. He was not forced. And what I will tell you is, the Trinity handles this brilliantly, but humans mess it up all the time. We need to work on the concept. We get rid of the concept because we think it's what leads to the abuse of individuals in our world. It is not. It's our human broken approach that leads to abusiveness. Do you think the father was taking advantage of the son? Do you think he was just throwing him to the wolves or more specifically on the cross? just so that he didn't have to go through this? I want to ask you a question. Think about this. What do you think is the greater, what do you think is the greater sacrifice? Is it sacrificing your life for another, or is it the sacrifice of the life of your child for someone else? And I will tell you this, every parent already knows the answer to that. They will lay down their life before they would give up their child's life. We have so little comprehension of what suffering was like on the cross for Jesus, but even less of what suffering was like for Father God to see his son have to endure the cross. We have no idea what that was like for him. If you want to understand the love of God, think about that. Because that's how much he loved us. That's how much he loved us. See, humans, they abuse God's order. And when that happens, real people get damaged. But that doesn't mean that God's order is wrong. When God's order is followed, people are redeemed and they are restored. And when we see people being abused, I don't care how religious it sounds, it is not God's order. It's wrong. It's a violation of his intention. God created human beings, both male and female, to be in his image and to be equal before him. That's how he created us. One more point and then we're done. We're called to communicate the truth in a way the culture around us understands. We are called to communicate the truth in a way the culture around us understands. So Paul actually makes a statement here. I don't know if you caught it. If you did, you probably... Um, argued against it in your mind when he said that even nature teaches us about how long a person's hair should be. Does nature teach us? Well, let me ask you, whose hair is longer, the male lion or the female lion? <laughs> the male lion, right? So had Paul never seen a lion or heard about a lion? Did he not know? Or, or even like this. Do you think that Paul is saying that men's hair actually doesn't grow as long as a woman's hair? I mean, that's just not true, is it? How many guys in the room? You still have to cut your hair. You didn't just go out here. You know, for, for, <laughs> for us guys, like our eyebrows only get so long until a certain age. 
and, and then they start taking off again, and, and we got to clip those puppies down, or it gets, it's distracting to people when they're trying to talk to you. They just, it's true. So what's he saying here? He's not saying that this is built into nature. He's saying it's what is common practice. Just look around you. And in their culture, for men to have long hair was not considered acceptable. And in their culture, for women to have short hair was a form of humiliation. And he said, pay attention. Tell the truth in a way to your culture that they can understand. Aren't you glad that, that we don't have to dress like however they dressed back in first century Christianity? We don't even have to dress like they dressed 100 or 200 years ago. Uh, the good news is, in our culture, is, is if your fashion is out of style, it'll be back in in just a few years. So you can do that. So what he's saying is we have to think about the choices we make and what it communicates. So here's some discerning questions to ask on the personal choices you make. What does this choice communicate to others? What does it communicate about my relationship to God? What does it communicate about my relationship to others? Whose attention am I trying to gain? Have I prioritized my personal freedom over the desire to help others find the grace and the freedom of God for themselves? Are you more interested in proving who you are than proving who Christ is? And Paul says, we just have to take the responsibility of communicating the truth of the gospel to the culture around us in a way they will understand. We have to own that. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, this is hard for us because, we, honestly, we've been so influenced by our culture that when we read scripture we don't even see what you're trying to say we just hear what other people say around us would you help us to recognize that we can't ignore the world around us that there are ways to challenge the world around us but we have to do it intelligently strategically intentionally so that they understand what we're trying to say, rather than just reject because of how we communicate it. Help us be people who in all of our language and all of our decisions, our priority is for others to know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand this morning.
So Father, help us. We, we have